Well, hello there, everybody, uh, and thank you so much for, for joining and uh, closing out GrimCon. I want to give everybody, uh, right now, we, we can simulate a conference right here. Now, we won't be able to hear you, but I want everybody to give a round of applause for Bryson and everybody else that put this together uh, to make this possible. So everybody give a round of applause. Yep, come on, I know you're doing it right now too, right? So I'm not the only one doing this here. Um, but at this, this, these types of events are incredible, and the fact that we've uh, morphed into uh, being remote to talk uh, about security issues, talk about topics, um, having Gabs come in and talk about COVID-19 issues and viruses in general. I mean, just pre pre presenting our experiences uh, and being able to share in this types of formats are just absolutely uh, incredible. So thank you all so much for, for listening to me today. Uh, what I'll be talking about today uh, is called, you know, finding the calm in the storm. And uh, this is really kind of a, an understanding around how we've evolved in, in security and really where we've gotten to today on the main stage. When we say something as a community or as an industry, it resonates uh, throughout the entire world. It has ripple effects beyond anything else. And it's, it's a lot different than 10 years ago when we were crying wolf all the time of, hey, this is going to cause the Internet to go down. This is going to have, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. We are actually at the table with people. We're actually talking to folks that, that actually make a difference in, in how the world works. So we are, you know, talking about risk specifically. We're talking about threats towards the world. Uh, and I'll be bringing up Zoom uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a caveat to that. And so, you know, today's talk is really talking about how do we formulate a message uh, to the world when it comes to situations where there are catastrophic events or things that happen. Uh, at the very end of the presentation too, I can't not do something technical. Um, so I'll be also showing some of my um, application control bypass techniques that I've been working on uh, 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 to circumvent some, some known detections. So I'll get into that um, towards the very end uh, of the presentation as well. I don't need, uh, you know, I won't go through a large introduction, but I just want to say, I'm, you know, so, so thankful to be part of the information security industry. Um, I've been in this for 20 years, uh, which really is starting to make me feel really old. Uh, I had someone say, say the other day that I, I work with, you know, I, or I, I play video games with on a regular basis, you know, that they've been in this industry now for about seven years. I'm like, wow, I remember my seventh year in the security industry. That was, uh, I was a young kid then. And uh, so things have definitely changed and, and, and we've grown into different ways. And, uh, you know, it's, it's changed a lot differently from when I was in. I remember, you know, seeing CDC, the Cult of Deck Cows and, uh, you know, the Schmoo Group. Uh, the Schmoo Group to me, uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid growing up, and I know, I know it's going to make Bruce and them blush because they're, they're a lot older than I am now. Um, you know, when the Schmoo Group was coming out, it, those guys were just like my heroes uh, uh, growing up. I remember being at DEF CON and they made this uh, UPS device where uh, you could, uh, um, you know, intercept traffic and then funnel it back to a C2 channel. Um, you know, and this is, you know, really early on in the 2000s. I think it was like 2001, 2002. And uh, those types of experiences uh, really uh, helped me grow into who I am today. So you know, I'm thankful for, for all those people and being in the security industry uh, for, for this long and being able to talk to folks and, and hopefully resonate uh, on some of those things here. So welcome everybody. Um, we are talking about the world right now, right? We're talking about technology that impacts everything. We've also seen how much technology um, is is really making a difference in the COVID-19 fight. When we're reverse engineering uh, the virus itself and figuring out how it works and having technology build out models and using networks and devices and, and, and our smart devices to, to help with contact, uh, who's been in contact with people with COVID-19 and all of these different things where we see technology making a massive impact in how we sustain um, our day-to-day -day lives. Without technology today, if this pandemic would have hit, it would have been an absolute disaster across the entire world. We would have seen catastrophic losses more so than we see today. A lot of us in the security industry are fairly untouched uh, when it comes to a lot of what we're seeing. I'm not saying everybody, and I, I, my heart goes out to all you folks that are, are struggling with work or jobs or things like that or furloughs um, during these periods of time. But the technology industry in general just boomed when this, this whole thing happened because we were able to accommodate you know, a massive influx of companies that were going to, to work from home, uh, organizations that were able to just really uh, shift their architectures in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, and you look at that and you say, wow, that was, that was incredible. And mostly, you know, most organizations were able to really move to a, a, a work from home strategy relatively painless. I'm not saying it was easy, but relatively painless to where they can still conduct a lot of their day-to-day -day operations. This type of thing that we see today has never happened before in my lifetime. And at least not that I can remember, right? We've never seen a, a pandemic um, at this scale in any way, shape, or form that has impacted our economies, economies across the world in such a way in our daily lives in such a way that really fundamentally changed us. I mean, projections were two to three million, you know, potential people in the United States just killed. I mean, a worldwide massive, massive losses. 
nothing like this has ever happened in our life before, right? And that's scary. So we have, we have, we have fear. We have people worrying for their lives. We have people worrying for their loved ones. We have people worrying for their jobs, their health, their security, all of these things that, that we really took for a luxury um, every single day. And, you know, you, when you look at that and you say, okay, we have all of these problems happening out there. And now you have, you know, technology really bearing the load on what we see today, the economy, what we do from a day-to-day -day operations, being able to work from home, being able to facilitate communications. You know, we, technology was really looked upon as, as the temporary fix for us to continue to move forward while everything else was, was shutting down and, and, being, and being destroyed. We're kind of used to that though, uh, in the security industry, aren't we? In the security industry, you know, for, if you've been in here for, in the security industry for a number of years, you know, massive issues that impact a global scale are a normal day occurrence for us. You know, companies that that ignore risk, uh, you know, new 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 exploits, new malware, new ransomware campaigns coming on, shutting down hospitals. You know, we're used to dealing with very uncertain issues happening in the technology space, but maybe not so much when there's a pandemic and technology at the same time. So we have always been one of those types of industries that. You know, if we see something or something is, is uniquely bad, we point that out and we want it to be fixed. Look at Tavis Armani, probably one of the best security researchers that we've ever had. Uh, Matthew Graver, another one. You have so many just brilliant minds when it comes to the security research side. You look at, you look at what Tavis does and, and Tavis is, is black and white. He is, hey, you're gonna fix this in this time allotted or I'm gonna publish all this code and it's gonna be on the public at this specific date and time. And he doesn't budge that. He's black and white on how he re releases all that information, and and that's a, a process that companies understand and relate to. And if they don't, they get that information dropped and, and puts their customers at risk. And if they do, they fix it and during that period of time, and it's released and it works that works through that process. Ample time to fix a lot of issues. And so we're kind of used to this process where responsible disclosure. We go through and we say, hey, there's this bad issue out here. You need to fix it. And if you don't, we're going to publish this so that you do fix it because you're going to get a lot of ramifications from your customers and everybody else wanting you to fix these security issues. And that has worked substantially to changing this entire industry. I remember going back, I mean, when I went back, let's just say 15 years, I remember, so this is 2005, uh, I was doing a research project on, uh, on fuzzing an application. Uh, it was, uh, what was it? Oh, my, it's escaping me, it's 15 years ago. Um, anyways, I was, I was, uh, I think it was Spiceworks. It was Spiceworks, uh, an IT uh, management inventory system. And I was fuzzing it and I found a zero day crafted an exploit, and um, I worked with the company on, on addressing it. They didn't even publish the, the exploit or the advisory. They just put a new version out, but it was actually a back version. So if you even downloaded the old version of the code, it had the fix in it, so you couldn't even prove that the exploit was there. And obviously I had the binaries, I was able to do it. But what was interesting is, is young Dave would have loved to have dropped a zero day and, and, and published it on Millworm, uh, now exploit DB. Uh, again, I'm really dating myself on that front. Um, and, and looking at them and, and showing from a street credibility perspective, hey, I had all these awesome exploits, I did all this awesome stuff, you know, check it out, here's all my research, here's all my code, here's how you bypass data execution prevention. I remember I did one of the first papers, um, so Egypt uh, did a paper, I think it was in FRAC, on, um, on bypassing data execution prevention, but it was, it was more so a conceptual idea of, of what you did. And I remember I wrote a, a debt bypass uh, for, for SL Mail, and I spent probably a month in my basement just figuring out how it worked in order to, to do all this stuff. Then I published all the research. And so you look at that and, and, and what was back then on how you release things is very much different today because you know, we have changed Microsoft. You, know, you look at Microsoft 15 years ago, they were a complete joke when it came to security. You look at them today and they're they are leading a front in many cases on a lot of the areas around security, especially with how they deal with things. Now we can all argue that there are many things wrong with, 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 with Microsoft. But as a whole, they have done a substantial amount uh, uh, different to change their organization, their culture, and the security to really be effective in a wide scale. Same thing for what we see it built into Apple products, um, into a lot of other organizations. You know, look at Cisco's history and then, and then to now, again, much, much more improvements when it comes to security. Again, not perfect, but we have made a difference in the world when it comes to technology and security. And so you go back, you know, back in time. And all that's changed. Uh, and, and when I look at, at what changed back in time, we listened at a different level than we were 10 years ago to now. We are completely looked at uh, upon at, at the same table as any other person uh, when we're addressing risk when it comes to security or when it comes to any risk across your organization. I remember I worked for a company called Diebold uh, and I came in after the voting machines. I like to throw that, that out there. Um, but I, you know, when I came in at Diebold, 
security was looked upon as any other risk, uh, whether it was a, a supply chain issue, uh, whether it was you know, how we manufacture our products and our interruption to our customers. Risk was looked at uh, from a security perspective in the very same way as anything else out there. And so when, when I look at, at this and I, and I say, hey, security is actually being taken serious, and seriously, and again, not across the board, as is any risk across the board. Um, the, the quote from Spider-Man from, uh, from Peter Parker's uh, um, uh, uh, uncle was, with great power comes great responsibility. And we have great power now, right? We have the ability that when we do our analysis, when we do our research, that it is taken seriously. People actually listen to us in what we're talking about. And that also means that people listen to us in what we're talking about. When Spectre and Meltdown came, came, uh, came out, the world listened to us. Now, was it the earth shattering, you know, it's gonna completely destroy the world? No, it was, a, it was an obvious problem. Uh, and, and there wasn't a really good fix for it, especially when you get down to the chip level, but it, the world listened. When Eternal Blue came out, the world listened. You know, hospitals actually shut down, but people were actually patching and shutting down their companies and being able to respond effectively. Uh, you know, we look at that and we, we try to say, hey, when there are major issues out there, we can communicate in a way that drives risk. So what, what happened to responsible disclosure? And I like to use Zoom as a, as a case study for this, okay? And, and, and it should be no, no question, if you've read any of my Twitter posts, my, my perception on everything that's happening from a, from a Zoom perspective. Now, what's interesting with Zoom is that this company you know, started off many years ago, but really the shift of, of when this COVID-19 happened, Zoom just blew up like to epic proportions where they were housing churches, you know, hospitals, con uh, corporations, personal family meetings, because we were all in quarantine. And what, what, what made Zoom so successful was its simplicity. What made Zoom so not successful was its simplicity. So by default, when you started your, your personal meeting IDs or PMIs, uh, you know, you could, it would start off without a pin. Same thing if you, you uh, created a, a, a session, um, you know, it didn't have waiting rooms enabled by default. It had all these features in there, but by default, it made it so easy for people to install and for people to, to use that it, it became extremely easy for people to, to, to evaluate. And what was interesting about what happened with Zoom over the past couple of weeks is that everybody now is terrified of using Zoom. And if you look at the risks that we actually found, or the researchers actually found, and I don't want to um, uh, uh, discredit uh, what you know, the security researchers took their own personal time to go through to find those you know, phenomenal resources to go through that data and, and, and to actually go through and, and, and determine whether or not it's safe or not. But what was actually found were a lot of local privilege uh, um, escalation issues, one privilege escalation issue, um, and then you know, uh, a UNC path where you can uh, spray credentials out to SMB if you click a link, uh, which is more inherent on the Windows side than it is um, the Zoom side. And then you had uh, issues around encryption, uh, where they were, um, if, if, if when you're in the United States, um, if the server itself became unresponsive, you couldn't reach to it, it would route to uh, a different location, happened to be China. Now they've since fixed all of these issues. What was interesting is, is we published all that data all at the same time, all at once, um, and all public without working with them in any way, shape, or form. So we basically published zero days and exploits directly on the internet for people to see that had no idea what a zero day was or what a security issue is or what the risk is in any way, shape, or form. And what the security industry communicated was is that Zoom is ter terrifying to use and you should never use it. And there are people that are in my Twitter feeds uh, stream saying, hey, since they implemented AES, terribly horrible, which I agree, horrible, uh, with ECB, uh, you know, they, 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 they can never be forgiven. They can never, ever be forgiven. Uh, they should completely burn to the ground and no one should ever use them ever again. And, and I look at that and that's, that's security people talking to other security people, but people see that. The news sees that. You look at the news articles that came out and it was, you know, Zoom is insecure, you shouldn't use it. Again, local privilege uh, escalation techniques. I'm not saying they don't have their issues, uh, uh, issues around security. They've, they've done a good job up to this to responding to it. Uh, with the zero that came in with the local privilege escalation with OSX, um, it was fixed within one day. I have never in my career seen a company as large as Zoom fix a zero day within one day, within one day of publishing out their entire organization. That was phenomenal. I'm not saying again, it should be in the first place. They should obviously have better uh, uh, Q&A process in their, in their um, uh, software development lifecycle, but they fixed it within one day. And then they came out and said, listen, here's all the things that we're doing to improve. We've enabled all this by default. So waiting rooms, default. Password pins, default. PMIs of passwords, default. They put a security tab in there so people can control people sharing information, default. That was in less than a week. So they looked at that and they said, let's fix this because obviously we're getting destroyed 
by security researchers are getting destroyed by the media and we have to go and address it. Now, that's great because they addressed it, but the damage that occurred during that period of time was substantial. You have people, I, I remember I, I just scheduled a, a, a Zoom meeting for, for Easter Sunday for my church. And I literally had probably 15 people in the church email me saying, hey, is it, are we gonna get hacked if we use Zoom for a church? That's what they're asking. And so we, we, we created a message out to the world that, hey, Zoom is not useful or Zoom is not secure in any way, shape or form and you shouldn't use it. That's what people saw when it came to that. And that is our job to communicate, hey, when things are safe or things are not safe or when things are, or, or when people are at harm. Is a local privilege uh, escalation issue or a UNC issue uh, a, a complete reason to discredit or discontinue and use of an entire product? Now, again, I'm not saying that they haven't had their share of exposures. You look at their CVE counts, it's about 30% less than Cisco WebEx. So do we still use Cisco WebEx? Do we still use GoToMeeting? Well, what about end-to-end -end encryption? Do you know that Cisco WebEx, uh, Microsoft Teams, Skype for Business, uh, and GoToMeeting uh, do not support end-to-end -end encryption? Now, people might be saying, well, GoToMeeting supports end-to-end -end encryption. Interesting, when you enable Go to, uh, GoToMeeting's end-to-end -end encryption, you no longer have video capacity. It's really weird how they phrase it in their documentation, their architecture diagrams, and I could be wrong on that, but based on everything that I read and, and the options that I've been able to specify in GoToMeeting, it doesn't seem to support end-to-end -end encryption full out, uh, throughout through. And again, if I'm wrong on that, that's fine. I haven't gotten any clarification from, from GoToMeeting on that. So you look at that and you say, well, we can't use Zoom because it had two minor low, medium to low threat uh, exposures. Should we just discontinue using in the first place? And that's what we're running against. We have to have a clear message when something like Heartbleed happens, when something like Eternal Blue happens, that we can go out there to the world and say, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is a disaster. Because Zoom wasn't a disaster. It wasn't a disaster. I, I, you can argue all day long that Zoom has its issues around security vulnerabilities. And I will, I will agree with you wholeheartedly. Is it to the point to where we shouldn't be using it in corporations? No. Is it at the point to where you shouldn't be using it for, for your, your family and friends? No. Is it at, at the point where you shouldn't be using it for you know, your church or, or for critical meetings? No. Should you use it for top secret government classified information? No, nor should you be using WebEx or GoToMeeting when they, when they don't support end-to-end -end encryption. So these are the things that we have to get better on when it comes to communicating to the media, to the press. And, and I have failed wholeheartedly in that several times. My, my information has been taken out of context a, a ton of times. And I, I go back to the news reporters and I try to get it to adjust it. Uh, I try to get them to fix it. Uh, in many cases, it doesn't happen. So it's, it's also how we communicate to reporters. It's how we communicate to the news. It's not about getting out in the news. I've been in the news a lot, and it's not because I like to go in the news. I like to think that I have a clear conscience when it comes to trying to portray what the security industry is trying to portray, but I couldn't back this whole Zoom thing that was going on. I couldn't do it because it felt like we were just piling on to a company for media, for press, to scare the masses during a pandemic of where people were using it to facilitate communication. And again, I'm not saying that the default shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, they absolutely should have, but we really dropped the ball to the rest of the world when it came to how we communicated the issues with Zoom. And I wanna emphasize, I'm not defending Zoom. I have no linkage whatsoever with Zoom. I, have, I, I don't know their CEO. I don't know anybody in their security department. I haven't done work with Zoom in the past. I have zero ties to Zoom whatsoever. I don't own any Zoom stock. Uh, my whole thing with Zoom really dives down into why we communicated the way that we did. It was literally the entire industry just completely crapping all over a company because they have some issues. And instead of working with them to fix it, being responsible and disclosing that, we looked like a bunch of children. And that's really my problem that I have is that we've grown so much, we've accomplished so much, we're at the table so much now that I feel like we got set back 10 years by us focusing on this issue here. And, and people take us so seriously now because we've been very specific at communicating before in the past that they believe us and they believe that Zoom is insecure and they believe that if they install Zoom, it's malware. I, when I saw that, there was an article that came out in The Guardian saying that Zoom is malware. Uh, one of the, the, the people they interviewed said Zoom is malware. You shouldn't install on your computer. That is terrifying to people. What, if I install Zoom, I'm going to have malware on my computer, malicious software. They can eavesdrop on me. They can snoop what I'm doing. They can enable my camera. They can steal my banking information. No, that's not what happened at all. That's nothing like that happened at all when it came to installing Zoom. But yet, that's what we communicated out to the rest of the world. So Zoom should fix their issues, and they seem to have a plan for doing that, right? Um, and, and I'm not defending their lack of, of, of secure by default. I'm not defending the, the fact that they had two you know, uh, security exposures that were addressed, low to medium uh, 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 threats that they, they can address. Um, that, you know, I saw uh, what Mudge put out. Mudge is one of my heroes, by the way. 
uh, what Much put out around um, doing the analysis around the binaries on Linux itself. Again, they have things that they need to address and they, uh, they need to fix. But from their past experience of what they've done, you, know, you look at 2019, we had the web server issue. They fixed that within a day. Um, they, have, uh, they have a bug bounty program. They have had a bug bounty program for, for a, a large number of times, uh, for, not, for a, a, a long period of time. But again, they're doing the right things. P software inherently is going to have security exposures and vulnerabilities in it. And, and it's to them to fix it and how they respond that makes them um, all the better when it comes to this type of thing. I do want to emphasize kudos to the researchers. Um, I mean, I, I am criticizing how they they did um, drop the big blog posts and you know went to the media and, and, and overhyped this in, in many ways. I, I disagree with with how you did it. I'm not saying you're you're bad for doing it. I'm just saying I disagree with how we communicate that message. I think it did way more damage than than good. Uh, but I do want to say that it was great research. The time that you spent on it and and the time that you always do on it, uh, you know, is is always welcomed and always awesome when it comes to what you're able to accomplish. What we saw in Zoom was, was common. Uh, when we do source code analysis for applications, we find you know low to medium exposures all the time. We find highs and criticals uh, all the time. And that's the whole purpose of, of doing it beforehand versus after, and Zoom really needs to learn that lesson. One thing I'll say is that agile development has really made it difficult uh, in many cases for this, and, and we really need to get better um, at how we do security testing in, in agile and being able to build checks into place prior to going to production, as well as the continual testing afterwards too have to get better at that. And Zoom's main issue was really simplicity, right? Um, the simplicity around PMIs, the simplicity about clicking one link, the, the installer permissions, uh, um, one less click to them was a big deal, even though it circumvented or used deprecated APIs within OSX. You know, all of these things were, were, were things that, that were done from a decision and a UI standpoint of simplicity that didn't take into consideration security. Again, they've since switched that, that may, they may lose some of their competitive advantage when it, came to it, when it comes to it. And I talked about this already. I'm not going to uh, beat the, the drum on this anymore, but we scared the masses in this specific situation. We literally terrified the world to use Zoom. And it was being used as a main communication method for people to go and use uh, for facilitating communications. And talking about people that are depressed, people that are being laid off, people that are just trying to see their families. And now they can't communicate anymore to them. They have to go to different alternatives that they don't know about. I had a family member that tried to start a go-to meeting and no one knew how to use go-to meeting, but they're too scared to use Zoom. Obviously, I had to talk to them about that. Um, so, but but we had four people show up instead of 15 that we had the previous week because no one knew how to use GoToMeeting. I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the situation that we caused based off of this. And this is just my own personal experiences that I'm having to deal with explanations for those. School scared, business is scared, population scared during a pandemic. So what we did during a pandemic. I'm really not happy about that whole thing. So this is one failure. I mean, we, we obviously failed uh, in this specific case, in my opinion. And, and again, you could disagree with me. It's totally fine uh, having different perspectives and views, but we need to figure out how to communicate as one cohesive industry, very much like the, and I'm not saying the medical industry has one cohesive voice, right? You have people that differ on treatments. You have people that differ on the best way to tackle us, different modeling numbers, projections. But as an industry, they say, hey, COVID-19 is bad, right? This is a, a cataclysmic issue that we're dealing with right here. We need to be very much on the same page when it comes to specific exposures uh, and how we disclose it. If it is cataclysmic and it has the potential for hurting individuals or hurting, hurting communication during emergency situations, we need to disclose that to the, the organizations first before we actually, um, before we actually uh, provide it to the rest of the world to show what actually occurred there. So we have to work on that. Um, one thing I'll say is Zoom responded better than anything I've ever seen. They responded within one day and fixed the bugs. One day, another issue came out, fixed it in one day. That's impressive to me. Uh, I think they, they are taking it seriously. I'll say that they probably focus more on features and functionality and security, as do a lot of companies. Not, not, uh, not giving them a pass on that, and they should absolutely be focusing on that as part of what they do moving forward. But again, shouldn't be uh, uh, us scaring the actual masses. So before I, I'm, uh, before I kick it off, I know I got about uh, five more minutes left. I wanted to show um, some stuff that I've been working on. So what I've been doing uh, a lot of, as of late is a lot of the uh, living off the land uh, binaries and scripts Sorry to switch that's completely technical now. Um, but uh, a lot of the living up land binaries and scripts that we see out there today um, will get flagged by uh, antivirus and EDR products. And so what I've been doing is uh, if you go to uh, lawbassproject.com, uh, lawbass-project.com uh, run by Odvar Mo and a bunch of other folks, if I can type and talk at the same time, that'd be fantastic. Man, oh man, one second. There we go. Um, one thing I've been doing is taking a lot of the, the uh, living off the lands and converting them into bypassable uh, techniques that don't get flagged by either EDR products and or um, antivirus as well. 
And so I have a massive list of these that I've been working on. And obviously, if I publish these uh, ones, they will um, you know, be picked up by, by, by specific signatures as soon as I do them. Um, but in this specific case, I, I wanted to show you the example and simplicity uh, of a lot of these um, and how easy they are to circumvent. And so this is, uh, if you're not familiar with Living Off the Lands, so I'm just going to be really quick on, uh, on the description. There are um, applications, and they're, they're, they're um, on uh, OSX, Windows, Linux. And these are applications that help the operating system run or a third-party application you install that's code signed. And when you do code signing, um, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, things like uh, application control or application whitelisting uh, will be, uh, um, uh, be, be uh, there'll be exceptions put in place for those code signing certificates. And so why Living Off the Land works so well is that ha they have additional code execution functionality, like Registry R32 is the one I'm going to use today. Uh, Registry R32 is the, the, the most notorious one um, out there because it, um, because it is it's one of those ones where, where uh, it's used by malware. Uh, it's very common to see out there. And if you see Registry R32 in most cases, uh, you can get around it. I gave a great talk if you want to take a look at uh, Wild West Hacking Fest uh, last year, where I actually knew I was going to get caught, and I still fooled the defender uh, when it came to Registry R32 and just telling a different story by social engineering the SOC analyst that was going to see my alarm. So I crafted my attack very similar to what a SOC analyst would do from a review perspective and actually got around their detections, even though I got alarmed, it got, got triggered as a false positive. Um, in this specific case here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this. Is, I'm running Windows Defender, and I'm just using Windows Defender as an example. I'm not picking on Windows Defender. Um, the folks over at Microsoft do a, a, a fantastic job. But this is an example of kind of the bare bones level of security, um, it, it being antivirus. Even integration into things like the anti-malware scan interface and, and other things that we've seen out there before um, have gotten better. Uh, it's still very easy to circumvent most of the detection criteria on both EDR products um, and, um, uh, and antivirus. And so you can see here, I just updated this um, April 14, 2020. So this is today. Uh, and when you look at virus and threat protection, the only thing I've turned off is cloud delivery protection, uh, delivered protection, because I don't want um, this to be uh, uh, triggering uh, and sending the information directly to the cloud itself. So we have real-time protection on, it's fully up to date. Uh, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go ahead and run Registry R32, okay? Now I have two machines here. Um, in my SCT file that I have, which is a scripted object that I'm gonna be executing, I have test.txt. And all this is gonna do is just run calc.exe. Uh, now what's funny is uh, I gave a presentation and I showed this uh, a couple times and uh, there was a signature written just for my specific script, which was that. And all I had to do was just put, and it got around the, the latest detections. So, you know, very easy changes to get around some of the, the detections that they have in this specific case. But a lot of times the high fidelity alarms are a little bit harder to get around. Um, in this specific case, we're gonna be downloading uh, a, re um, uh, a scripted object and we're going to be executing that. So I'm going to run a, a quick uh, server. So we have a server running on 80, uh, and I'm using Python 3. The first time I did Python 2 still, and it had already been uh, phased out, I got yelled at. So I'm using Python 3. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to run Regis here at 32, and I actually need to get my IP address really quick. I forgot that. All right, go ahead and run that again. So this is my IP address real quick. And let me just change my IP over here, which you can't see, but I'll have it here in just a second. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to run RegSPR32 just, just by default of how you would download it from, from lawbassproject.com or any other uh, tutorial that you see uh, for, um, for living off the lands. And so if I run this, all I'm doing is I'm going out to the internet, I'm doing slash I, which is going to communicate out to a web address. Um, and and uh, it's going to uh, try to download via HTTP um, this test.txt, which is on my Linux box, and I'm going to call the serobj.dll, which is a scripted object DLL that's going to go ahead and execute uh, my code that I download from there. So notice when I run this, I instantly get picked up by antivirus, and I instantly get access denied. So my, my big issue with this specific type of, of protection is that instead of fixing RegSPR32 um, and, and, and removing the ability to download code directly from the internet and reducing the attack surface, they rely off of an antivirus signature. And, and it's obviously bad fleet wide because how would, it, how would it not be if you had a signature that blocks RegSQL 32 from going out to the internet? Now, there's a few ways to think about how can we get around this? Well, first of all, what we could do uh, I'll just save it as testing one at DLL. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy. SCR OBJ testing uh, testing one down. Now I'm running this as a, uh, a, a limited user account, so this is not an administrator account. Okay, so as a regular user, I can copy this file. Now from an EDR perspective, 
Copying a DLL is not going to usually trigger an alarm. Copying a DLL, a legitimate DLL is not gonna trigger an alarm. Now, if I copied Registry 32 and I renamed it, that would absolutely um, cause an issue. But I'm just taking testing.dll from a, from a um, strobj.dll and renaming it testing.dll. Now, what happens if I take the same exact thing and I just do Registry 32 slash I HTTP and I just do testing.dll instead of strobj.dll? We get our calc.exe, we completely circumvent the uh, uh, antivirus signature rules, and most likely uh, EDR. Now, some EDRs, we, 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 let's take this one step further. Some EDRs will flag on, um, on the HTTP and going out to a website and calling strobj.dll. So how do we get around strobj.dll being called, or uh, not strobj.dll being called, but, but what about um, getting around having to go out to an HTTP website? So here's uh, another example. Let me just, uh, again, change my IP addresses here really quick for the demo. Give me two seconds. All right. Oopsie. There we go. Oh, that's not it. Hang on. Let me just copy and paste that again. Copy and paste fail. All right. Let me. Uh... So here's a command we're going to execute. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use bitadmin. Now, bitadmin may trigger. Did you know you can use excel.exe, by the way? Excel.exe, you can go out to an HTTP site and it'll download the file in the text file regardless of what it is. Um, you can use a number of ways. Um, you know, there's curl in there now. There's, there's a whole bunch of ways of downloading uh, direct files. But what we're going to do is we're going to take bitadmin and we're going to go out to this website and we're going to download test.txt. And then from there, we're going to save it to temp test.txt. And then we're going to call registpr32.exe and have it uh, execute that test.txt with the um, scripted object DLL. Now, in this specific case, we are not going out to a website. Again, we're running Windows Defender, fully up to date. Uh, we're going to go out to this website and we're going to run the specific command. And we're not going to actually call uh, the, the test.txt directly from uh, the HTTP flag in registpr32. We're going to use bitsam and do that transfer. And bada bing, bada boom, we're able to get around. Uh, again, these signatures that are out there, in most cases, evading a number of the EDR products. Some of them do look for just RegSphere 32 in the first place, having any network communications. My recommendation for you uh, would be to use something like process hollowing or, um, or another technique that, that um, calls a application outside of the parent-child process relationship trees, like RegSphere 32, that doesn't have network communications. Um, those are a lot of the easy ways <laughs> to circumvent that, still kick it off uh, and not be detected. So that is it. Um, I'm out of time, but I do want to thank everybody uh, for for holding in there on a late night uh, on a on a uh, was it Tuesday? I don't even know what days it, days it is anymore. Um, but I want to thank everybody from Grimcon. I want to thank Bryson. I want to thank the entire crew over at Black Hills for helping out as well uh, for making this possible. And really, thank you so much for for having me, Bryson, uh, and everybody at Grimcon for staying on. Uh, salute. Hey, well, thank you for coming in and joining us. And I do hope I get to see you in a couple of months. Um, Me too. So just w one good question, I think the kind of cap for your keynote is uh, from Jackson Parsons. So with this situation, we potentially burned 10 years of hard work and trust building. What are some steps that we can take to regain that trust? That's a great question. Um, I, I think what we first need to do is, is tackle the situation uniformly around Zoom. Uh, we may have disagreements on, on how Zoom does its security practice, but is it safe to use for families and friends? Is it safe to use for corporations? I think having a standard voice to talk about that to news and media or out, uh, outlets is very important right now um, to kind of fix what we've done before in the past. Um, I also think that some sort of vetting process uh, where when we're doing research, having uh, more of a collective group group session, I don't know if that, I don't think Twitter's the, the right uh, uh, spot for that, but having more of a collective body, I'm not saying individual people, but a collective body of, of people that are well-known researchers or new researchers or new people coming into the industry could, could really um, uh, have a voice in, in, in stating what the actual risks are and communicating that outwardly. So more of a, a authoritative um, type of, of voice that it comes from all of us versus, versus everybody else. I, I think that's really, really important. Um, but I think fixing what we need to, what, what the communication was for Zoom, and I think having security really focus on that communication method we could help repair some of that. But also, you know, we need to call out, and, and this is such a, a tough debate, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little bit of a, a philosophical thing here, right? um, is, is, you know, offensive security tooling, does that constitute responsible disclosure? Um, you know, new exploits that are coming out, what, what actually constitutes responsible disclosure, right? 
I've always been in the, you know, I, I've released, I just released a bypass for Windows Defender the other day uh, for, for Unicorn and bypassing AMSI. Should that have gone through responsible disclosure? I go back and forth on all this all the time. So having some clear definitions around how we disclose uh, and how we communicate to people, I think needs to be a standard in the industry. And then making sure that companies actually have the ability to address those issues before it's it's made out to the media for the massive headlines of, hey, this is the zoom and, zoom, doom and gloom zero day and you know all this other stuff that's out there really becoming a voice of how people can protect themselves. Um, I think that's really important. I think the media sensationalizes everything uh, and, and that is our job to correct them and to be a voice. They can sensationalize that, that's fine. But if we have a consistent and common voice around, hey, this really isn't that big of a deal, but Zoom does need to do a better job when it comes to security. Those are things that that, that resonate with people uh, that I think take it, uh, take it a little bit further. All right. So, well, so a Security Justice League? <laughs> Started. With great power comes great responsibility, right? That's right. All right, man. Well, uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you. Uh, thank and you. to close things off, um, the winners of the COBOL CTF were first place Sniper, second place NEU, third place Fish. And we will be hosting a happy hour on Google Chat. So please uh, get the link in Discord. Um, send your comments and feedback to grimcon at grim-co.com. And we'll try to make these better in the future. Thank you all for making this such a great conference. Good night.